Welcome back, Agiteers. So it's been a minute since we've talked about technical stuff, namely Linux, my favorite uh, topic. So let's do that now. But before I get started here, I want you to know I'm going to try and do this video without any edits. And because of the medication I'm on for my heart condition, there may be stopping, stuttering, uh, starting again. And my worst thing is I forget words very easily, even the most basic of words. Of course, I remember them, you know, two minutes later when I don't need them anymore. But anyway, let's get started. So I've come up with um, five different reasons that I think FreeBSD is a good alternative to Linux. Of course, we can say safely, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So I'm certainly not suggesting that you should leave Linux because you want to try. Well, I shouldn't say that. Trying BSD is one thing, but I'm not suggesting that you have to leave Linux because BSD is a replacement. That is not accurate. So the five reasons I'm going to talk about here are just something that you can think about. Maybe if you're on Microsoft, you're on Windows still, or the distribution of Linux you're not really happy with anymore and you're looking to move to another distribution, check out FreeBSD. Now in a future video, I'm going to do a FreeBSD installation and following that will be another vid video where I do a FreeBSD installation on hardware. I hope. Okay, so let's get started. Number one, it's not Linux. So we know that Linux is just the kernel. A um, little bit different with FreeBSD. So we have the with Linux, we have the Linux kernel, and then we have various applications that are run. FreeBSD users will make a huge distinction between Linux, which is only a kernel, and BSD, which is, in essence, the entire operating system, all being built uh, by essentially the same coding group. But <clears throat> that's not quite the case. Um, the core operating system of BSD is, of course, coded by the same core group, but any applications you need um, are going to be coded by whatever groups have created them in the first place and are maintaining them. So let's use an example, um, LibreOffice. You could put LibreOffice on FreeBSD, but you could also put it on Linux, and it's not FreeBSD group that actually coded it, right? They're just putting this application on it. In other words, the core OS that is BSD, once you get done installing it, no GUI, no nothing, is not overly useful unless you need a super lean server, in which case possibly it could be, but I still think you would need to install other packages. So it is a distinction, but not a huge distinction. It might make things a little bit uh, safer because we don't have quite as many groups of coders uh, coming together to make the core part of the operating system. All right, number two, FreeBSD will run almost all Linux packages. When I say Linux, I know it's a kernel. We all know that. That's why we're having this discussion. I'm referring to any applications that may be able to run on a Linux operating system that has the Linux kernel, which is basically all of the Linux distributions. Okay, So um, if you have an application that you like, like we talked about LibreOffice or maybe a particular desktop environment that you like, you can install that most of the time on BSD and specifically FreeBSD, although there are many other versions out there as well. So that's something to consider. So this installed base of packages and applications that you're used to having with Linux, you can still have with FreeBSD. All right, number three. And this one is relatively 
typical of Linux. There are two main ways to install packages. Uh, the first is a binary installer, the PKG package installer. So you just run PKG in the name of the package you want. It will download it and install it just like other binary installers that we're used to in Linux. The second way is with what's called ports. And the ports availability of packages is much greater. Ports, on the other hand, um, have to be compiled. Now, what's the bonus of compiling? Well, for one thing, theoretically, the code should run the best when it's compiled for your specific system. <coughs> so that's a good thing. The other thing is you can make alterations or changes or apply patches to the code that you're going to compile before you do, and that's a good thing. So. It's, it's something that you would want to customize if you're using ports, whereas the binary, if it's good enough, you know, once again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I would say that I would install using the binary. Uh, the ports have far more packages available than do the uh, binary, but there's still a ton. Number four. I don't know if you've checked, but um, looking at the various distributions and their documentation and the state of their documentation, and I'll use um, Fedora Linux as an example, they have fairly good documentation. So if I was rating them out of 10, I would give them <clears throat> uh, a D plus, six and a half out of 10. Why? Not because the way the documentation is written or any of those things, but one, they don't have complete documentation. And number two, the documentation is very old. It's behind. So if you're in 2021 and you're using the latest version of the Fedora kernel or installing the latest version of Fedora and the documentation was written in 2017 and there are differences now, that's a problem. So we don't have attention to documentation the way that we do with FreeBSD. If you want to check out the documentation, you can go to docs.docs.freebsd.org. The cool thing is, of course, you can get it on the website, freebsd.org. You can download a PDF, which is awesome. So I downloaded a PDF and I put it on my Kindle so I can read it anywhere, anytime I want. You know, I'll probably update it every six months or so because changes will be made. But right now, it is the most comprehensive documentation. I recommend you download the PDF or check it at docs.freebsd.org and look at the sheer volume of menu options of the items that are there from the most basic to the most advanced. And not just FreeBSD, but networking, what it means, the different components in networking, everything is in there. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, even if you weren't going to get into FreeBSD, you should at least look around in the FreeBSD documentation. It'll give you a really good understanding of Unix-like operating systems and some concepts that you should know if you're going to work on um, a Linux system or FreeBSD or any Unix system, to be honest. So documentation, huge advantage, huge. It makes it much easier for you. Matter of fact, if you do a search for some things, most things that have to do with FreeBSD, it will come up on your search and the top ones will be from freebsd.org. So the top results that you get. And number five, we have licensing. So the Linux GPL license that is used, GPL version 2, GNU public license, is considerably more restrictive than the BSD, FreeBSD license. So the FreeBSD license is two clauses. It's very, very short. 
one of the things that you can do with FreeBSD is you can create binary packages that are uh, private, closed, right, made by a company and place them on a BSD server or a workstation and you have no duty to uh, make that code available for that particular um, binary package. And if you look out there, say for example at Mac OS, they actually have taken that BSD, the base OS that we talked about, and put tons of their own private code on there. They do not want people to be able to look at the source code and be able to compile it and basically make a Mac OS without the terms Mac OS. With the GPL license, um, one of the more popular versions of that was when Red Hat created their operating system, Arhel, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and they then had another company, well it wasn't a company, it was an organization, create CentOS, which was a bit-for-bit -bit copy of the Red Hat operating system. And it just didn't have the logo. So they, they can do that because they took the source code and made a bit-for-bit -bit copy because the GPL license allows you to do that. With FreeBSD, you can do the same thing, but if there's any private software that is a binary on there, there's really nothing you can do with it. You can use it and follow the original uh, creator's license uh, for that particular software, but you can't really make any changes. So that's why Apple is using FreeBSD as opposed to Linux, because they don't want to be held to the GPL version 2 or 3 standards of the license. It's much more um, restrictive as far as what you can do with source code. So those are the five reasons I think you should consider looking at FreeBSD. Only if you're unhappy with the Linux distribution you're on and you're thinking about moving and you're looking around. Keep in mind, Linux and FreeBSD are both Unix-like operating systems, but there are differences. They're not huge, at least of what I've seen, and you know, on the surface they're not huge, but there are differences, and some things that you're used to may or may not be there, or they may be in an altered version. So keep that in mind. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like and subscribe. If you really liked it, drop me a comment. I want to know your opinion on what you think about Linux versus FreeBSD or the BSDs. Very curious. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. This video was made possible with support from viewers like you. If you find this video useful, consider becoming a patron for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com forward slash fast gadgets.